Great, thank you so much. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here at my second ever Skoll World Forum. Um, a special thank you to our panelists for joining us, but to all of you for being here for uh, this important discussion this morning. We are here, here, of course, to talk about the important and very timely issue of how to ensure that refugees and migrants are, are better economically and socially integrated into the communities that they live in. Um, this is a topic that's not only relevant to the theme of this year's Skull World Forum, the power of proximity, but it's uh, something that's relevant to a lot of day-to-day -day events that we're reading about in the news. Um, just some quick uh, statistics to kind of uh, set the table for what we're going to talk about. Um, and these are from 2017. There are an estimated 258 million migrants, 65 million forcibly displaced people, of which 22 million are refugees. Um, this discussion is about um, bringing these figures, which are, I think, often dehumanizing and overwhelming because they are so large, um, down to some tangible issues that can have meaning to all of us and importantly to the audiences outside of this room that need to be engaged more effectively. Um, we're here to talk about personal experiences, local solutions, and more effective policy making. Each of these individuals that we're talking about when we, we look at these numbers that are into the millions has their own individual stories. These stories are compelling, um, they're often heartbreaking, they're often heroic as well, um, and each of these are stories that need to be told more effectively. And I'm really honored to be sitting here with four individuals who I think will, will help us do that. Um, I know a lot of you are convinced already, um, but for those who are convinced, I hope that you'll leave this room with some better data. Um, with some better stories and armed with a lot of tools that you can use to help us reach the many audiences who are, of course, unconvinced. Um, and this is something that I think is becoming even more urgent um, based on some of the political developments we're seeing around the world. Um, we're here and I think we will leave with a strong business case for why refugees and migrants should not only be welcomed, uh, but they should be partnered with and invested in. Um, and um, this is something that we're looking forward to hearing from all of you in this room here about as well. Um, and while I hope this discussion will really focus on examples of local solutions, approaches, and policies, um, I would be remiss to not give a little bit about the global context given my role at the UN Foundation and the work that I do day to day um, working with UN leaders. Because this is a year of an intense focus on refugees and migration at the UN. Um, this is because a lot of the UN's day to day work is of course related to situations like the ones we currently are seeing in places like Syria, Myanmar, South Sudan, and many other parts of the world. Um, these events and the implications they have have triggered UN and government leaders to, to work towards two what we're calling compacts for refugees and migration. Uh, both of these are kind of working through slightly uh, separate uh, but related, of course, processes and will culminate later this year. Uh, but they are two sets of international agreement where if they're well, um, well negotiated, but even more importantly, well executed, they have the ability to touch millions of lives. So we hope that you'll also um, come out of this room armed to be effective agents of change to your governments um, on how serious these processes need to be taken. Um, and I will say they are certainly a top priority of UN leaders, including the top UN official, Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who previously served for 10 years as the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. He's also said recently that managing migration is one of the most urgent and profound tests of international cooperation in our time. And I think he's certainly right. Um, and finally, just one final point related to the global context, but I think this is also the local context. Um, Getting all of this right is also important for the implement implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. I think many of you are familiar with the SDGs, but this is, of course, the plan for a better world that world leaders adopted in 2015. And we're aiming towards uh, a number of targets um, for the year 2030 that we hope will make for a better world. Many of the 17
17 SDGs are relevant to refugees and migration. Um, and achieving the SDGs really is the best means of preventing conflict and sustaining peace. Um, we call them a blueprint, and I think they can certainly be looked at as a blueprint for some of the issues that we're going to be talking about today. So um, really looking forward to getting into what I know will be a great discussion with our panel here. And then we, uh, we're all committed to talking to all of you as well. So we're probably just going to have a relatively quick discussion and then jump into audience Q&A. So get ready for that. I'm just going to say a quick word about all of them to alleviate the burden of them having to do basic introductions of themselves. Um, and we'll start with uh, Salim uh, Salama who is a founding member of the Network for Refugee Voices, which is a refugee-led initiative working towards inclusive, sustainable, and effective refugee policy. Salim was a bit of a late-breaking addition to our panel, but fortunately he's a student here at Oxford University. So I, as I just said to him, he's at least um, suffering from the least amount of jet lag. <laughs> but maybe Bob as well, because you're in London. Uh, Sana Mustafa is also a founding member of the Network for Refugee Voices. She's also the founder and manager of Sana Mustafa Consulting LLC, where she consults with various institutions on designing engagement policies related to refugees. Um, she's a Syrian refugee since 2013 and uh, currently living in the United States. Premal Shah is the co-founder and president of Kiva, I think a well-known figure here at the Skoll World Forum, but Kiva is of course a crowdfunding website that connects people through lending to alleviate poverty. I'm really glad that you're able to join us as well. And Bob Anibale, uh, the founder and head of inclusive fin finance at Citigroup, where he leads partnerships with organizations at all levels to expand economic opportunity for the financially underserved. So I think Kiva and Citigroup are certainly two companies that are um, you know, following the mantra of the SDGs, which is to ensure that no one is left behind. So Sana, um, I think we'd, we'd love to start with you. Um, as I mentioned, you became a Syrian refugee in 2013, but you're now running your own company. Um, just tell us a little bit on how you got from there to here and kind of what your experience has been like. Sure. <clears throat> um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for Skull for making it happen for me to be here. As a um, Syrian with a Syrian passport, it was very, very hard for me to get the UK visa. Mm -hmm. And I literally got it at 6 p.m. on Monday and I flew on at 10 p.m. So we made it happen. Thanks for the UK government, I guess. Um, <laughs> Thanks I can't say skull. that. <laughs> um, and yes, I, I think when um, when people ask me about you know my story and what I like to say, I'm going to share with you a little bit of my life uh, because it's literally I think a story really the word story detach the reality of our lives. Um, but first, what made me a refugee in first place is the um, the Assad regime. Basically, we become refugees for a reason. We are forced. Uh, displaced persons and uh, as, a, as someone who is against the Assad regime, as uh, someone who protested that regime and comes from a very political family, um, leaving Syria wasn't an option as my, my own father got kidnapped by the Assad regime on July 2nd, 2013. Uh, I didn't have the choice to, to go back to Syria and my mom and my other two sisters as well fled walking to Turkey. And until today, we don't know anything about my dad. We don't know whether he's alive or dead, which um, just a side note about the file of, you know, missing persons and detainees at the Assad regime's uh, prisons who probably would never know if they're alive or dead. Um, knowing all of this, I've become a refugee um, in 2014 officially as I seeked asylum um, in the United States in New York. Um, and I was at the beginning actually in DC Someone came to the US with literally nothing, with, you know, with all the meaning of nothing. Uh, no family, no, no legal papers, no money, no one, not even friends. And uh, the way I survived the first year in the States is um, just literally sleeping at people's couches, strangers' couches. And one stranger led to another, and they all now have become friends and family. But that's, this is how I survived at the beginning. And then when I was trying to obtain a legal status to not be illegal um, through seeking political asylum, you know, you find out that it's a very expensive um, 
and like, very rigorous process. Um, and this is when some organizations who actually provide this pro bono services become very useful. Um, so my case was adopted by Human Rights First. Um, it's an organization that does pro bono work on as with asylees. And eventually I was given asylum. Um, and my mom and my other two sisters who uh, fled to Turkey due to my dad's detention, um, they also had worse circumstances, I would say, considering um, that there are millions like them in, in Turkey. And um, unfortunately, my 13 years old, who just turned 18, um, is, was out of school for four years. So no high school for four years. And I think that this is uh, one, one of the worst outcomes of, the, of displacements. Um, and my other sister as, as well was out of school. And gladly now, both of them, they are uh, in schools. But due to family unification policies that we really need to revisit and work on, uh, we actually cannot be in one country together. So due to the travel ban, they were rejected to come to the US um, to be with me. And then uh, one fled to Germany when everyone, you know, with the whole uh, flow. And then another one fled to Jordan and my mom is alone in Turkey. Knowing all of this, <laughs> um, it was really definitely tough to make it in the US. Um, but at the same time, I am the, I am the lucky one in the family that I actually was in the US, considering um, that there is opportunities, opportunity there, and I was able to obtain scholarship uh, and go to school. And eventually, you know, I was thinking of what I want to do and how I can do it. And I was, I was just, I think it came out from, from my frustration with um, the current work on refugees. I mean, first, it wasn't an issue. The whole refugee crisis wasn't a big deal until we started fleeing to Europe. And that itself, I think, is a problem. We started calling it a refugee crisis when we as Syrians and other you know, um, nationalities started fleeing to Europe. As long as we were in the Middle East, it was fine. It wasn't a crisis, it's just the usual things. People in the Middle East killing each other, just conflicts, very normalized. And uh, I, when I was in the US, it really meant nothing in 2013, 2014 to be a refugee, to be coming from Syria. And then suddenly, on 20, in 2015, everyone is is uh, like woke up and asking what can we do, and I think you know to be appreciative. I think later better than never, definitely, and I'm really glad. But then I was frustrated by the way things are being done. It's just I mean until now, unfortunately, we see um, a lot of you know these development projects on refugees. Just for 50 years, they have been done the same way without us without us as refugees. And even if you think of other causes, not only on refugees, you know, any development project in the, going to the developing countries, they are very exclusive of these, um, of, uh, of these uh, affected populations. Knowing this, I, I, I decided to start my own consultancy, basically to be the bridge between those who want to help and those who are affected. And uh, to be honest with you, if I wasn't in the US, I probably would have not been able to do this. Because at least in the US, there is a system in place that allows me to obtain work permit in the first place and to actually uh, receive support from the community because you know, there's a lot of resources. And to, to legally actually just register a business, it's, just, it's a system that you can navigate and you have a place for you to do so. Whereas if you're in Turkey or Jordan or Lebanon, you actually cannot do this because you don't have work permit in the first place. Thank you. I was, I was thinking the words human spirit um, throughout much of what you said, both yours, um, your families, and also some of the people that were able to help you along the way. And I think that's really what we're getting to, is how do some of these international policies kind of get down to these issues of human spirit? Um, Salim, I think we'll turn to you next. Um, you're a partner of SANA's in the, the uh, network for re refugee. I'm sorry, I'm getting it a little wrong now. <laughs> um, but you were also forced to leave Syria in the middle of um, getting your law degree. You're now, of course, here at um, Oxford completing a master's. So tell us a little bit of your story as well and maybe um, some of what the, the network works on. Uh, it was a very difficult law degree, so usually I credit it to the war that I couldn't finish it, but actually it was really, really difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but then I ended up in Oxford, so I didn't learn from my mistake. Um, <laughs> doing another very difficult degree at the School of Government here, uh, Master's of Public Policy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for being here. It's a pleasure also to be sitting in this panel um, with a very old friend, also um, Sana. 
I used to actually, um, Norsana's sister in Syria, we were engaged in some uh, student organization uh, movement for students who uh, were uh, against all status quo in Syria, whether it was the government status quo or any other militia group wanting to impose a status quo. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I come originally from uh, Damascus, south of Damascus. I grew up in a um, small or rather big neighborhood called um, Yemu um, Camp for Palestinian refugees, so um, Syrian Palestinian. Um, and I uh, left uh, end of 2012 um, for several reasons. One of them, mm -hmm. I'm, I was at the age of conscription and I've chosen uh, one, not to take part in any killing processes and two, uh, not to serve in the government army as well. Uh, beside uh, that, um, I was active like hundreds or like millions of Syrians active in the student movement, um, which is not something very appreciated by our government. Um, and I've been living in Sweden for the past four years. So thanks to Sweden, actually, I didn't have to ask for a British visa uh, up until the moment. Um, and I came uh, to Oxford University on scholarship um, from Plavatnik School of Government, uh, where I was given the opportunity to continue my studies um, and my research and work. Um, and uh, last year, March uh, 2017, uh, we were in Brussels and uh, it, the network of refugee voices was the outcome of um, several uh, years of negotiations and debates and conversations and brainstorming with uh, a number of friends and allies, uh, including uh, our very dear friends from Independent Diplomat, um, whose motto uh, was the first thing that got me really intrigued with, with their mission, that is justice and diplomacy. Um, you know, because usually diplomacy is really about uh, those who can afford to be in the room. Um, and we never afforded to be in the room, neither as Syrians who are against the regime, nor as refugees who were forced to flee their countries. So justice and diplomacy, that's what NRV is trying to do. Diplomacy of refugee work, uh, of uh, the debate around us that is usually doesn't involve us, um, and several other uh, tasks uh, that we hope to be able to talk about throughout the panel. I love um, what I you said during our prep call, nothing about us without us. I think oh, yeah. that needs to be one of the you rally think cries. it's obvious. Yeah, it's yeah, not. It's not. Um, and Pramal, I'm going to turn to you next. Um, despite, I think, two other very obvious cases of why this shouldn't be a perception, I think there's probably a pretty strong perception that investing in refugees carries a different type of risks than investing in other uh, parts of the population. I know you do that at Kiva, so tell us, uh, debunk some of this myth and tell us a bit about um, some of your experience working with refugees at, at Kiva. Sure, so uh, if Kiva works with uh, a variety of financial institutions as well as social enterprises, some of which are in this room, um, to help you know, fund uh, those on the front line uh, with uh, zero percent interest, risk tolerant capital to do things uh, that are at their risk and cost frontier. So what does that mean? Um, if you are a financial institution, um, uh, let's take Lebanon. Uh, right now we have a partner, Al Majmua. Uh, they uh, have 50,000 microfinance clients. And in <coughs> Lebanon right now, one in four people are Syrian refugees. And there's, you know, not great right to work laws. Um, and um, there's, um, you know, a lot of host population resentment, um, and uh, you know, meanwhile the the the, the situation is quite protracted. So we need to think about post humanitarian solutions. And Majmua, um, uh, you know, was looking at lending to refugees, but they perceived the risk to be high. Why? Because of flight risk, because uh, you know, national ID. Uh, because uh, their own clients in the host community, as well as their own staff, frankly, have resentment. And it's not the easy, and then there's you know, just kind of uncertainty with government regulation and which way things are going to. And so if, if you're a bank or a microfinance institution, you're trying to manage risk, it's not the most appealing thing to do, even though the humanitarian cases are the common humanity cases there. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do is steer the, the internet community's risk tolerant, cheap capital towards programs that can create a, a, an R&D or a business case for prioritizing lending to a population that they might not have. And what we've seen is actually um, the way Al Majmua uh, uh, organizes their lending program 
is they start with non-financial services, um, uh, trainings for both host population, Lebanese, as well as Syrians. Um, and then they do things like just social events, like iftar dinner. Uh, um, and, and basically, as, as groups get together, Lebanese and Syrians, then from that group, they self-select into a group of four, typically two Syrians, two Lebanese, and they borrow together at a lower interest rate. And what's interesting is by coming together, there's greater financial access for both Lebanese as well as, as Syrians. And then there's social cohesion that starts to form. Now, what's really exciting is that we've now looked at the repayment track record. My web search turned something up. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. I think Innovation I at work. Syrian. Uh, Sy uh, well, anyways, sorry, Siri. Uh, All right. Siri. AI. Um, okay, so um, different panel. Anyways, what's, what's really exciting, I think the high order bit here, is that what we're, we're seeing um, in, in five different countries across 10 partners a repayment rate with refugees that, that matches the mainstream lending repayment rate, which then creates a, establishes a business case, which then um, you know, hopefully moves this part of the portfolio from something that's subsidized to kind of mainstream capital, where then one MFI microfinance institution is doing it and doing it profitably. And then ideally other microfinance institutions in the market start copying and ultimately banks start copying. And this is you know, one small example of where um, there could be a, a possible win for all um, if, if I think there's initial subsidy. And so the work that you're doing around the global compact, around the international community, really providing, I would say, the resources for low-income countries, low-middle-income countries that are hosting uh, you know, refugees, I think that's, that's absolutely essential in order to create um, you know, win-for-all solutions that uh, address a very protracted problem. Great. Well, a great example of connecting the importance of the, uh, the global to the local, but also I think one, a model that starts with this power of proximity and bringing people together as a way of solving problems. Um, so Bob, we'll, we'll turn to you. Um, I think maybe it would be a surprise to some people that Citigroup is thinking about um, refugees and migrants as well, but talk a bit about how your work intersects with those populations. Sure, and I, I wish we had another panelist who couldn't get a visa. So we're, we're grateful that you're both here, and Ahlam Asahlam, and welcome to Oxford. Uh, I think this, the issue of refugee and migrant, um, I find usage of this, of course there are legal distinctions in different jurisdictions, what that means, but we have migrants all over the world that are not being documented as necessarily refugee. And, I, and there are those leaving Central America for very good reasons, and, and Danger their family that are in the U.S. You might and they'll be called migrants, illegal immigrants, and yet they would in other contexts be a refugee. And so I think for us it's a very clear view that the needs of the community, if you think in proximity, and I look at the United States and community development as well. So I'll quickly pivot on the U.S. and mm -hmm. then maybe some work in the Middle East. You know, if I think of the United States, if you look at somewhere like New York, 37 percent of New Yorkers are foreign-born. Los Angeles, 39% of the city was born outside the United States. And if you get to Miami, it's almost 58%. So having people who've come from, migrated from elsewhere is nothing new. It's not a thing of the past. It is the nature of the society and communities we're in. And you in Brooklyn will be very clear of that, right, by the diversity around you. But again, the, the status of people as a migrant or refugee makes a huge difference. Your ability to work, Sana, is because you've got a legal standing as a refugee, and for which very few in the U.S. are actually able to get. Um, it's, it's a very, as you say, a long um, process for which you can't work while you're going through it. You have to pay the cost, <coughs> you have to live. And we've really taken a look at the how do you integrate in the sense of not socially only integrate or saying you have to give up your identity becoming a, in the United States that way, but create another identity. And to be able to help people to, who are migrants and refugees to re-enter re into the new societies that they're living in and be able to work, will be able to be productive. I know many people who've come abroad, we will find as refugees, and you'll see, I'm sure you know it, through the Middle East are not just, as many think of them, as destitute poor people. And Syria is the best example of middle class, educated, skilled doctors, engineers, teachers, many, whose credentials aren't even recognized where they go. So I think in London, if the electrician who helped me was worked on a power station as an engineer 
in Iraq. In London, he's, his qualification is unqualified. So he's doing electrical work in people's homes. And we have to be able to think of how do we make it a pathway for people who are refugees and, and migrants into the communities they come. In the United States, for example, we know at the federal level this is not going in that direction. Right? There is less and less of a receptivity. But what's important when you think of proximity, as Brian spoke about, was that in our cities, the mayors of those cities I spoke to, they know in half their cities, foreign born, or a third. And they know that the next generation probably is another third of their population. So we created a, an alliance with mayors, a city, city group, or a city bank, however you think of us, with the mayors of New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago called Cities for Citizenship. And it really was about a pathway. We used the premise that there are 10 million, almost 10 million people in the United States who could be citizens who haven't been able to get there yet. But realistically, we were talking about tens of millions who should be on a path of some security, of some ability to reunite family, some ability to be able to requalify or to work. <laughs> Today, there are 42 mayors that are part of that alliance. And I think it's about sometimes <coughs> our local communities hearing and responding. In the Middle East, just as another, because you're, I think of these both from Syria, we, we're not in Syria city, but we're in all the neighboring countries. So we're in, whether it's Lebanon or Jordan or Israel for that matter, we can look at it. Many of the populations in, for example, in Jordan or Lebanon where we work and where we look at organizations together as Premel does that do micro lending, are dealing with multiple generation of refugees. I mean, the Palestinian communities in all of those neighboring countries, and previously probably in Syria as well, are still without necessarily the, the legal status to fully engage. <coughs> and yet, look at Sana. In America today, one third of new businesses, are small new businesses, are started by immigrants. It's a vital part of the and dynamic of our of lost energy, lost opportunities. So we're working with the IRC in, on a project, uh, about a two-year, $2 million project, to have about 1,000 youth entrepreneurs and getting them the training they, that we think will help and getting them some capital start. And these are in Jordan, it's in um, Nigeria, and it's in Greece, working with refugee communities. Because, the, we, again, as you spoke of the lost time of someone from school or elsewhere, it's really about engaging that youth and being able to say, where do we create that pathway? So much of what City, yes, Citibank is doing is on a microfinance side, we're lending to organizations that do, as Premo described so well, that reach the end entrepreneur. But I think on a systemic and even on a political, by our being involved, at a, at a, I guess that is a large commercial name and working with 42 mayors, at least in the U.S., and then looking at that abroad, we have to create the safe environment for people to succeed. And, and I think we have to accept that Many migrants are refugees as well. They don't just have the status today that, they're that they should be thought of and entitled to. Great. Well, thank you, Bob. Um, I do want to turn quickly back to Sana and Salim and this question of why refugees um, aren't um, more integrated into decision making and policies that very much affect their own future. I mean, we know this clearly isn't happening well or effectively enough. Um, are there some good models that we should be looking toward? And are there particular places where we should be you know, pushing extra hard to ensure that um, you and many around the world like you are brought in in a better way? Yes, um, please feel free to jump in at any point. Um, a great model would be NRV. <laughs> um, so just to help you understand what we do as the Network for Refugee Voices, which I will refer to as NRV, is um, basically think of NRV as an umbrella. And it has, um, and it's a membership organization that really has refugees from all around the world. For, so we're very diverse geographically. We have people from Africa, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, Latin America, South, uh, North America, Europe, Middle East. And um, so we are around now 40 uh, members and who are all refugees or refugee-led organizations. And uh, we work um, as with NRV collectively on, um, le on a local, national, and international level. And however, also the members, the 40 of us, have their own organizations. That, so they work also on their personal capacities on some aspect of the refugee crisis. And they all have the first-hand experience. 
Um, so we, we have the first hand experience being refugees and going through the systems and navigating the systems in different geographics. And then we also have the expertise and the professional experiences. So what happened is basically last year, um, we, we, we started having these conversations with independent diplomats, um, which acts as our secretariat and basically it's literally the force behind us and organizing us. Uh, and uh, we just came together and we decided to launch this, um, I would say, movement because we're actually changing, um, we're changing policies out there. Um, and now we're a year old. So if you think of what, um, what I mean, our main mission and basically our key message is that literally nothing about us without us. It's that simple. You, you cannot shape my life without me. And so those these policies do really shape our lives. You know, we think of this, you know, with this initiatives and all the great initiatives out there. The main obstacles for these initiatives are legal obstacles, policy obstacles. The reasons re refugees are not able to work in Jordan is because they are not able to obtain a work permit. So it literally everything comes down to policies. So what we do in as NRV collectively is work on these policies. And from our perspective as refugees, which you might never, as someone, as a, just a stakeholder interested in refugees issues, you might, it might never occur to you. So what we're doing right now is basically engaging with on different levels. Um, I would say two important things, initiatives for, to know about NRV that we've done. First, you know, as refugees, we don't have um, like formal representation at the UN, right? We're stateless people. We left these states, these countries, we fled them. So when I try to engage with the UN, basically Syria as a member state rejects me and get me out of the room. And the same for other refugees. So what did we, we decided what happens is that we worked on this and now we are actually the first refugee, refugee delegation participating in the formal consultations on the Global Compact on Refugees. We're the only de refugee delegation in the room. We're only a year old. And now the other great initiative that you should learn about, and please um, just side note, we're gonna be in that collaborative uh, cafe afterwards if you have any questions. Um, so we're actually organizing the first global summit for refugees in June, um, just before the last format consultations on GCR. And this is gonna be the first summit in history that designed by refugees for refugees. And 80% of the attendees will be refugees and refugee-led organizations, not other you know, stakeholders. It's always the opposite. Um, and now, if you ask me what, um, what's, what's stopping in our face to move forward, um, different things, definitely the resources. Um, we're short on resources, right? I mean, ID does its best, but uh, this is something we're looking for. The other thing is just the resentful against even the idea of us being in the room so many times and just accepting, we're really actually so many times uh, deterred by INGOs, by people who work on refugees issues because they have been doing things in this way for 50 years. They don't want someone else to come and say, well, you know, this is about me. I don't think I want to do it this way or it should not be done this way for this reason and that reason. Wow. I was going to ask you. <laughs> Salim, do you want to add anything? Yeah, thank you. I don't know <laughs> if I can add anything after this, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'll do my best. Um, I think what, what Sana alluded to is, is um, on so many levels, um, resonates with many populations of refugees and migrants around the world. And this is not only the case of Syrians. Mm -hmm. We always like to say that as Syrians today, maybe we, get the sp we have the spotlight. For, for better or worse. And we would like also to use this spotlight to talk about others. There are 65 million refugees around the world, uh, not to mention migrants. Um, and those uh, out of those, there are only uh, five to six million Syrians. Um, so let's not forget the rest as well. And I think what we are trying to do at uh, NRV, Network for Refugee Voices, is to remind the world that the conversation did not start with Syria and will not end with Syria. Conflict has been one of the, unfortunately, one of the key characteristics and, and uh, moving forces of a human race. Um, and we cannot expect it to, to, to be over after Syria crisis is over. Um, but the other dimension I think we are trying to bring in at Network of Refugee Voices is to, you know, the power of proximity. Uh, and speaking of proximity, people don't become refugees coming out uh, from the depth of the Mediterranean. Um, they are refugees for very clear reasons. Um, uh, as one poet liked to say, nobody leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. 
uh, and the the what 2013 and 2014 showed is that the Mediterranean actually is not a border. This proximity <laughs> that we thought separated the two shores of the Mediterranean wasn't anything except uh, a, a, a very dangerous journey for people to make and people still made. So um, bringing those different voices within NRV, we also talk about the politics of what makes people refugees, you see. Mm -hmm. um, Syrians do not leave home uh, just because they have different options and they chose to leave home. They leave home because they are being bombarded. 95% of Syrians are killed by the Syrian regime, uh, are killed because of the military operations of the uh, Russian government, uh, the Syrian government supported by the Russian and Iranian governments. So there are political reasons. And I think when we are doing refugee work, um, I really urge you to remember the politics behind it. This is not only about our humanitarian duty as individuals or as organizations or as social enterprise to do good. This is also about acknowledging the reasons that drove people uh, through this undignifying journey. And we don't do them justice when we do not talk about those difficult matters. They are not difficult. We are just sometimes don't have enough courage, I think. So the political dimension of this process is very important. And it's very important if you also want return on investment, to use the, the economic language, because I think uh, Part of the uh, return on, on uh, a lot of the great initiatives that are taking uh, place uh, by several financial institutions is to recognize that also, unless we work within the political framework and the challenge that it is brought about by this political framework, we can't really have a sustainable intervention, mm -hmm. you see. So, of course, I realize we are all governed by mandates and we have limitations to what we can do, but we all have friends, we all have allies, we all have colleagues we work with and collaborators we, we, uh, we create things with. And I think we need to keep pushing on different fronts, um, whether that within the UN or outside the UN, whether with the groups like ID, Independent Diplomat, uh, uh, pushing from the uh, back to make sure that voices like ours are present in, in different forums, or by uh, talking to, to uh, uh, governments. Or So I think just keeping in mind that this is not only about creating job opportunities, this about thinking not to have to create job opportunities. I know it's too much to ask, but I think it's, it's we do people justice, especially people who weren't lucky enough to even be called the ref refugees. Those are half a million Syrians in, in, uh, who were killed since 2011. Those are hundreds of thousands of Yemenis. Uh, those a lot of South Sudanese. Uh, those a lot of Congolese. So let's keep them in our thought. And let's make sure that we don't have to actually work at the end, but rather at the very beginning. Uh, Premal and Bob, um, we are going to turn to the audience in, in just a moment. But um, I think we are, we're getting some extremely compelling um, stories and points of data and you know specific issues that get to this issue of redefining the narrative. Um, what would both of you add to this, you know, from the work you've done at your respective companies? Bob, maybe we'll start with you. I think that, you know, one of the, you bring it up very clearly. And for those of us who can, can have an influence politically as well, we have to do that. But that's a long and sometimes entrenched problem, right? It's not just in Syria. We have regimes, it's called regimes. We have administrations in many places that are complicated around this issue. I think the voice is also where all of civil society and business matters. I mean, ultimately, that's some, we, we underestimate sometimes the, the power of the brand, the power of the leverage, the access that it gives you. And, you know, whether we do a program with IRC, uh, even the fact that City is doing something with the International Rescue mm -hmm. Committee, we do it in, in California as well. But when we talk about it in, in the Middle East or in Nigeria or in Greece, it was a message that this these issues are real and that we have got to find a way to make them you know, acceptable but more sustainable when we even have them closed the source because no ocean is going to be wide enough, no wall is going to be tall enough to stop people from seeking protection or opportunity. And I think the other thought we had is documentation. It's very boring. But you know, try to open, as Sana probably did, try to open a bank account, or you might have here, 
a bank account or a basic yeah. facility when you arrive somewhere as an immigrant, any immigrant. First thing they ask you for is a utility <laughs> bill and somewhere with an ID with your address, right, and a photo ID. I mean, it's very complicated. And to allow people to function, and most of them are sending money home to families as soon as they can with whatever they can, is something we've tried to work on too. And it's, it's the kind of basic things that we have to be able to, to, to get businesses and others who have access to, let to, to regulators and legislators to say, what else did we, what other barrier are we putting up for people, even if it was unintended? So I think there's a voice and a role for business in this uh, and philanthropy, not just on the, the, you know, the obvious side of relief, but on helping people to, to function in the place they may be for a long time. Great. Susan, you asked about um, how do we create new narratives, and uh, I think uh, the Refugee Study Center here at Oxford is doing really good work to that end. Um, they did a study in Uganda, and Uganda has great, uh, relatively speaking, right to work freedom of movement laws versus other countries. And the stat that really stuck out for me from their, their research is in Kampala, 21% of refugees um, have businesses that employ other people, and 40% of those employed are host nationals, are Ugandans. And so we're looking for more and more proof points at how this can be a win for the host community. And we need to, we, you know, a lot of international um, assistance is needed to make that, um, uh, to make that a reality. But I think that is an important thing uh, to not, uh, you know, if the narrative is it's a zero-sum game and that if someone who's migrated here takes away from the host population, if that's the, if that's the narrative, I think it's going to lock us into, um, into uh, something that is not um, uh, kind of, uh, going to result in in, in, in in what could what, you know what what we could really imagine um, is is possible and what could actually really be great for um, for for the country. So I, I think we need more proof points like that, and I wanted to highlight that stat. Okay. Oh, okay. Audience, uh, we'll start in the back. The woman on the right, and please do wait for the microphone to make sure that we can pick you up. Thank on the you webcast. very much for all of this panel. My name is Lara Satrakian. I'm the publisher of a platform called Refugees Deeply. We cover these issues on integration. So good to see you. Um, and I wanted to ask all of you, particularly you, um, about actually refugee returns, another issue we cover closely. In the political context you described, how do you see the return of Syrian refugees playing out? And what does that say about what we need to be doing in integration strategies? There's somebody who wants to jump in. Yeah, sure. Um, this is this is something we we we've been asked about and um, discussing with uh, a lot of our uh, friends and the um, diplomats within the European level. And um, I think return where? Return mm -hmm. where exactly? Uh, this is the this is uh, this is the standard reply we have because I think it's it's uh, absurd that we are. Um, discussing even the, the matter, I think. Um, as you know, the vast majority of uh, the people who were, the, the areas from people where, where people fled were um, destroyed by the government bombardment. So around 90% of the destruction in Syria is a systematic destruction because of bombardment and because of the use of heavy artillery. Uh, so um, the, the, the idea is, is, is really difficult to, to imagine, to perceive. Not to mention, of course, within migration studies, we talk about always about um, um, uh, circular return, in which people might have a desire, a, a real, a serious desire to return because they want to, but then they return to, to nothing, and then they have to return to the country of refuge um, or where, where settlement, whether it's in Europe or around Syria. So I think the, the more important conversation about this question is about reconstruction, around reconstruction and around transition. You see, so there is no talk about return without talking about transition and talking about reconstruction. And why those two topics are very closely and intimately linked? Because we've been, we've been hearing as well in the European level, um, talking about reconstruction as if, you know, we need to build what was destroyed and send people home. So the political economy of Syria after 2011 is not the political economy of Syria pre-2011. And it's not going to be the same, definitely not. 
Um, we've seen in Lebanon, we've seen in many other uh, conflict-driven countries where you don't have a reconstruction that involves the community and speak to the realities, most probably you are going to build up buildings that will be blown out by car bombs in a couple of years. Do you think we have to recognize that the government might not want them back? Well, that's, that's uh, I think the, the current uh, uh, ethnic displacement uh, and uh, the expulsion from different parts of Damascus speak to itself, you know. Uh, Hundreds of thousands of Syrians have been ethnically transferred from south of Damascus uh, to the north of Syria. So, uh, under the watch of the international community, unfortunately. So, I think we, the Syrian regime is amazingly doing war studies a fantastic service because they are presenting new conceptualization of modern warfare. Mm -hmm. You know, how you transfer population, how you reconstruct the uh, country according to your own terms, how you bend the hands of the international community and tell the uh, international institution, you're going to give me money and I'm going to do reconstruction on my own terms, excluding millions of Syrians. You see, so, and this all takes us to transition. How do you achieve all of this when you cannot even, as an international community, bring the key preparator of war to the table and make them sit and talk and go through the items of the agenda? Seven years, seven years, more than 10 rounds of UN-sponsored negotiations. 12, seven years. I saw a lot you of You bring hands, them, so. they walk you through yeah. the agenda, they, ter they tell you we, we want to fight terrorists. Fine, let's, find ter let's fight terrorists, but let's not bombard civilians. Is it too much to ask? Thank you I for raising the point. I am gonna turn back, yeah. Uh, Karn Ross, right here in the front. <clears throat> Thank you. Hello, um, Karn Ross, independent diplomat. Um, thanks to Skoll for setting a welcome precedent of no panel about refugees without refugees, which unfortunately is a, a rare phenomenon. Um, but my question is to Salim and Sana. Uh, I pay tribute to you and the Network for Refugee Voices for being the first ever delegation of refugees to take part in a UN negotiation about refugees with an extraordinary historic achievement. And I hope a, a precedent that will be repeated from now on. I hope that you're setting a norm um, that will become systematic. I just wanted to ask personally about the experience because I'm a former diplomat. I know how weird state-to-state -state negotiations are at the UN. I know how exclusionary they are, how little they welcome the people they're actually about. And I wanted to ask for your impressions of what it was actually like to sit inside the room with member states of the UN talking about dry formal treaty texts that will become the global law on refugees. If I can, um, that's an amazing question because it's very actually also personal and professional on the same at the same time. Um, with part of my work with NRV in New York is I meet uh, bilaterally with member states working on GCM, the Global Compact on Migration. So, uh, with my other colleague, we held bilateral meetings with member states, and so we go to the ex state and uh, we say, well you know, you're contributing to the GCM zero draft and th these are the policies or the things that we should, that you should talk about. And then it's just being in the room at the beginning, you know, I think just too much focus on us being victims and not actually acknowledging that we have something to give out there besides the story. <laughs> and I think this is even when we go speak at the UN and you know, they. It's just that when I go speak at like, you know, storytelling at the UN or whatever, that's the thing. They focus on the story and us being the victims. And oh, like, oh my gosh, so emotional, heartbreaking. But then they don't take the points out of these stories. They don't, there isn't um, actionable items come out of this. So when you come into the room saying, you know, my story just gives me a legitimacy and ownership and agency to come here and tell you what I'm going to tell you. But my expertise and my, my work also gives me the agency to tell you this. And I think this is really has been a, a huge change. Um, but still, I mean, until this moment, when, when you talk about engaging refugees, so now some actors, private sector, public, educational institutions, NGOs, INGOs come and say, no, we are engaging refugees. So the question comes after how? Oh, we like we had this event, and there was a refugee telling a story. We checked, we, you know, we checked the box on telling a story by refugees, and so this is not meaningful. And best case scenario these days is no, we held consultations and we heard refugees, and then we're gonna decide what we're gonna do with them. But are refugees part of the design process of these consultations in first place? Are refugees in the decision making after these consultations? They are not. So when we talk about engagement, let's talk about meaningful engagement. 
some, some good examples here for how um, we should be uh, integrating young people <laughs> into decision making at the UN as well. And I think we have some strong advocates for that now. Um, I'm going to go to this side of the room, uh, sir. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kola Masha. Uh, I'm with uh, Babangona. Uh, we basically focus uh, in northern Nigeria, uh, trying to deprive uh, insurgencies of the oxygen they need to uh, survive. And um, one of the questions I wanted to ask was, I, I, I was really struck by the uh, discussion around uh, addressing this problem at the root cause, uh, some pre-conflict initiatives. And I would like to kind of get the perspective uh, of tangible things that you think organizations could have done, countries and organizations could have done to prevent refugees in the first place. Um, I think for us in Northern Nigeria, you know, we're seeing that you know, now with Boko Haram, people are deploying billions of dollars into the Northeastern part of the country. But in reality, if they could have done that five, 10 years ago, a 10th of that, you would not have this, you'd not have two million internally displaced people, you know, uh, famine, all the other challenges. Um, and so we'd love to get specific tangible steps that you think people could have done. Should we take another question while we think a bit? Okay. Um, in the back, sorry to, yeah, sorry for the mic runner, <laughs> getting a workout. <laughs> Hi, my name is Chitra, I'm with World Relief, and last year we, um, we welcomed into the United States our network 10,000 refugees, we resettled. Um, and one of the things, I, I just really appreciate you young people, what you're talking about involving refugees, because this is something that in my career I've learned that the people that are most powerful at, at the top should be the people that are affected by by whatever we're trying to solve. So um, when I took the job, I told my staff that I'd be there for five years and I'm mentoring a refugee into my position as executive director in the next four years. Um, and I just, I get so frustrated when I hear, like especially in the United States, 80% of all people in the C-suites are not people of color, people that are affected by whatever we're trying to um, address. But I think, we cop out a lot of the times and say there's not enough qualified people. There are. I mean, our leadership team is majority my majority refugee asylee. Our board is now refugee asylee. And as we're doing our programs, we um, have a group, like it's a didactic proce process. You're just always having to reach back and talk to people and ask, what do you want us to do? What do you think is the best opportunity here? Um, but I was just wondering, as you guys are thinking about developing your organization, how do you um, incorporate the voices of the other refugees besides Syrian refugees into your your cause? Because um, I know, like in Libya, we're seeing where we're housing, you know, millions of brown people all over this world. I was just in the camps, and in Libya, we're seeing that refugees coming up from. Africa are getting mistreated, um, discriminated against, as opposed to refugees coming from Syria in the camps. So how do you bring parity in your organization for those things? I think the questions touched on inclusion. Bob and Primal, you may want to touch on that, not that issue and how you think about it in the context of your organization the ongoing issue of how do we actually do prevention, which the Secretary General's focused on as well. So I, who wants to jump in first? You know, inclusion, and I'll, I'll stop. The state's side for a second, where it's a huge challenge, obviously, right? And we and others have, have trying to recognize where the gaps are throughout. And I don't think it's just about talent, you know, so that, that there's not enough talent for people. There's a long history and culture of in certain industries of people not even going into those areas who are talented feeling that that was not a place they were going to be able to pursue. But if I think elsewhere, and it makes me reflect on other international organizations, I guess because you know we're in a, a hundred odd countries, as, a, as in a, not many are, companies or, or anybody, and I mean, and I've lived in Bahrain and Athens and Nairobi and other places. I think it was the reality of what makes that possible and successful for us that our staffs almost everywhere, local nationals, 
almost everywhere. I mean, and they, otherwise they've been moved around. I mean, they're, they're from some other country. They're not from the U.S. particularly anymore at all. But they may have been from the subcontinent and they're in Africa and Africans are now in London. Or certainly the Middle East is for us. So it's been about realizing that we, how would we ever have grown organizations without having the very essence of the organization have that voice and that knowledge about the, the country, the market, the language, to read the front page of a newspaper, the subtlety of who are the leaders and where should we be or be away from or, or be lobbying. So I think it's been very much about being local. And I think as we look at talent and mobility within any country, and within the U.S., of course, because the large number of immigrants, we have a very diverse, that's for me, an enormous asset. An enormous asset. People like Sana, a new businesswoman, another new business. So we have to say dynamic. But around the rest of the world, it has many international organizations are not led. As aid organizations, or maybe even multilateral, are not led by local nationals. So, I mean, you miss so much of the voice and the knowledge that just seems to us in a business so essential. When I was in Lebanon last year and I met with um, a Syrian a shopkeeper who had a much, um, you know, kind of much more uh, successful business in Syria and he was walking me through his story and I was very moved and then he said you know if you go to the zoo the most dangerous animal is the human being and Cole I was reflecting on your question um, around prevention and 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 Susan I think you're right that the SDGs you know if if we make real deliberate progress um, that's one of the best things we can do. Um, and yet there's this notion around um, a you know, who we are as humans, um, fear versus love. Um, you know, we're wired for tribalism, but not hardwired for tribalism, right? And, um, and I think the work that you're doing is, is really powerful. And, and then I ask myself, what else could we be doing um, that... What are, what are real powerful levers? And people like Daniel um, at American Refugee Committee, I mean, he's a fantastic leader, um, has done a lot of thinking about issues like this. And I imagine folks here in the audience have ideas of things that aren't getting the attention that it should, but that could be very powerful. Um, and I'm certainly um, curious. Thank you. Sana, Salim, do you want to add anything? Yeah, maybe yeah. one word on prevention. Um, I think uh, what was been just mentioned is 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 uh, straight to the point because um, one of the one of our key characteristics as a humans, it seems that we we never learn from previous mistakes. Um, so you you asked the question and you answered, in fact, by saying that if this was invented ten years ago, invested ten years ago, we wouldn't be standing, sitting, and talking about this at the moment. And the same applies for Syria, because I really remember the beginning of of the uprising, um, and the you know the very marginal uh, rate of displacement uh, compared to later on when post two thousand thirteen, when you know like heavy um, warfare started to to take place and systematic destruction and bombardment. Um, but what has happened, happened, right? Um, and I've always told my colleagues, whether at the UN or in many other uh, high-profile forums, uh, let's try to listen to the local voices as much as we can, especially the people who uh, remained inside the country. Um, and those, I think, are very important, uh, as Robert said, very important, you know, compass to to tell you in which directions you should uh, you should go. Unfortunately, a lot of the major decision makers don't have the humility to uh, really pay attention and, and engage sincerely without only taking a box of saying like, oh, we held a local consultation. You know, you did hold a local consultation, but I'm going to ask you, what did you do with my thoughts? Because I know that the day after you flew to New York and you've discussed with people who can change the status quo. So I think this is the... And this is what we are trying to do in, in, in the summit in June when we are getting all those 80 um, voices of refugee-led or people with refugee experience, you know, to really find the international community wants to talk the language of written documents, white papers, and zero drafts. We're going to prepare one for you. And we're going to walk to the room, and we're going to put it on the table. And if you don't 
interact sincerely with it, taking us seriously, we're going to make a fuzz out of it. At most probably Syria Deeply, where they publish a lot of great stuff. <laughs> Salim Arsana, could you just say a word or two about when and where this is happening? I somehow don't know this, yeah, no, and no, I, I want everyone to leave with the places this year where they can engage yeah. around these issues. Uh, you mean our summit? The summit, yeah. yes. Yes, um, so our summit is happening in June 25th and 26th in Geneva, okay. so just uh, before the um, f final formal consultations of GCR. Um, and I just want to say one comment about her question in regard to our diversity. Um, so our main message is inclusion. So of course we can't we can't do this as uh, the S Syrian refugees because we are actually new to the whole thing, and uh, we are just you know one population of amongst the refugees populations. So as I said, we actually started around 13 members, and now we are around 40, and from literally all around the world. And then uh, and the amazing part, even for me, every every call we have, it's just learning lesson for me because. We have this network of refugees in Colombia and Venezuela, and then the network of refugees in D uh, DRC, and the network of refugees in Australia and Pakistan. And you'd be, I mean, you'd be uh, inspired when when you when you get on a call with us when we discuss some policies, how how in, in, uh, enriching the conversation is to hear their perspectives because they, act, you know, we say, okay, let's see today what policies we get, we want to discuss, and everyone comes up from different with a different policy from their experience. So we are, uh, I mean, and now our membership is open. So any refugees, um, advocates or refugees um, uh, led organizations, I would come to join NRV. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, yes, please. Uh, yes, gentlemen, second row. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Mark Clark. I'm CEO of Generations for Peace. Um, and I want to thank Skoll for, for creating the proximity that we've got in this room. Um, our work is at the grassroots, supporting primarily youth to engage on issues of conflict and violence in their own communities. And in many contexts, we're working in host communities uh, in Jordan, in Lebanon, uh, in Iraq, but also South Sudan, Uganda. We're working in northern Nigeria as well. So um, I, I really want to uh, follow up on the opportunity to engage with organizations who have far more expertise than we do on microfinance and how we can integrate that into our own work. It's not something we've done before, but I see the opportunity from what I've learned uh, this morning. Uh, that's probably something we should be doing by partnering with people with the right expertise. But I also am reflecting on uh, the, the conversation being downstream when we need to be working more upstream. And so I, I want to throw a few statistics out there. I mean, ultimately, the whole refugee conversation is a downstream conversation. And it's a very important conversation. But we, we must remember that there's a, an upstream effort that would prevent a lot of the issues we're wrestling with. In, uh, in peace building terms, there's great data on the cost effectiveness of upstream conflict prevention by the Institute for Economics and Peace. Their headline finding is that for every dollar you spend on upstream conflict prevention, you save $16 on the cost of violence. Global cost of violence is around 12.6% of global world product. That's about $14.3 trillion a year. We spend about $10 billion on upstream conflict prevention. $10 billion a year only on upstream conflict prevention. We spend about $11 billion a year on ice cream. <laughs> we spend about $15 billion on perfume. $18 billion on makeup, and so on. Yeah. So the, there's something wrong with the numbers there, and I, I want to appeal, what can we do collectively with the talent and the networks in this room to get the agenda moving on funding upstream for conflict prevention? Thank you. Great, thank you, Mark. And I should have said the other thing we want to happen here is to form new partnerships. So, <laughs> um, and this is why the Secretary General is focused on prevention because we're never going to get the type of financial flows we need to achieve the SDGs without um, finding some of these savings. We're going to do a bit of a lightning round because we're running out of time. And I saw a lot of hands. Um, yes, front row with the computer. Hi, um, I'm Emily. I'm a refugee lawyer from Australia, and I study at Oxford, and I'm writing the blog on this panel. Um, 
My question... <laughs> My question is essentially about the idea of the good, re the good refugee as a person who can contribute and can be productive to society. And as a person who has been working processing asylum claims, one risk that I see from the model of focusing on uh, economic integration and boosting the host community is for refugees and asylum seekers that do not fit that mould as a refugee or an asylum seeker that can be a productive refugee or contribute to society and, for example, in Australia, we're taking refugees that are highly skilled but what about the ones who aren't skilled and the fact that the definition of refugee doesn't include being a highly skilled asylum seeker essentially and your thoughts on how to prevent that becoming the focus for policy makers. Just respond for a second. I mean, sure. if you use the ref, if, if Australia is doing that, if your 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 definition of refugees are people who you specifically would like as immigrants, it's sort of the old quota in scoring. That's those are two different if they're issues. I mean, there, there's no reason not to assume that they will find a lot of skills that will fit that definition um, of of you know immigrants. You know, those who have quotas and that have skilled visas. But I think mixing the two is problematic. I think understanding that refugees and migrants, because this discussion, again, we're being clear that refugees of how government accepts that you are is a small percent of the number of people arriving in many countries as migrants today, because they are not able yet to get to that status. So I, I think it's problematic, you know, if you're only going to cherry pick those with the skills, language and, and that you would like. I mean, it, it leaves out probably the majority. Okay. Uh... Maybe uh, so they seem to be all on this side of the room, but uh, right in front here. <laughs> we'll take two more questions and then go I, back to the panel. I have quickly. a home in Kutu Palong and in Nacho Valley and Bidi Bidi. And so when I speak to my friends there, they don't want to go home and they don't want to stay there. So to your point, instead of looking at integration um, over the next decades, what about looking at creation? Last time it was made after, last time it was tested after World War II, it resulted in a country that is on par with the US and Silicon Valley in terms of you know, research, development, and forward thinking. I'd love to see that happen in different pockets in the Middle East, in Africa, in Southeast Asia. What are your opinions on that long-term thinking of new cities, new countries? OK, and then maybe just walk up the <laughs> I'll hear and we'll get two more and then we're going to turn to the panel to comment on any of these questions. Yes, right here. I'm Laurie Gehring. I edit climate change coverage for the Thomson Reuters Foundation. One of the things that we worry about in the climate world is the kind of things that you're seeing now. We're likely to see even more migration and, and climate migrants won't be classed as refugees uh, because that's problematic. I'm curious about these structures that you're putting in place now. It, that you're trying to work on to resolve these issues. Do you, do you have this in mind at all? Are you thinking about setting up or testing things that may be needed on a much, much bigger scale even than what we're seeing now? And one more right behind you, gentlemen, at the end. Hi, I'm Sasha Chanoff with Refuge Point. We find lasting solutions for the world's most at-risk refugees and support the humanitarian community to do the same. We're working on a coalition with IKEA Foundation, Women's Refugee Commission, and uh, many other leading organizations to try to promote self-reliance and build an evidence base about what works because uh, on average, about $25 billion a year go to emergency aid year after year after year to support people indefinitely in their host countries. If you look at the past few years, only about 3% of refugees have accessed any one of the three durable solutions, return home, local integration, or resettlement. Most are stuck indefinitely. We have to build an evidence base for what works in terms of programming that enables people to stand on their own two feet. Kiva and the work you're doing is a, a, a good step toward that. So I welcome uh, everybody to talk about this coalition, to ask questions. I'd like to ask you how you might engage with our coalition. We've created a self-reliance index that UNHCR, Refuge Point, Women's Refugee Commission, IRC, uh, IKEA Foundation, and others have co-created over the past two years that's a simple tool to measure movement towards self-reliance so that programming can be reshaped and oriented in that way. 
Okay. I'm going to turn back to the panel. We ranged from more effective use of resources, the importance of building the evidence base. Um, I'm glad somebody raised climate change and how we need to start thinking more about um, climate uh, uh, refugees. So who wants to start? We'll give everyone a chance to, I think we've got five minutes. Everyone can speak for a minute. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe two quick points. Um, building on uh, what we were talking about, the, the dichotomy before, between refugee and migrant. And I think the good refugee narrative is a very, 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 very important mm -hmm. uh, question here. One of my professors at Malmö University in Sweden, where I did my second undergrad after I failed by the first, uh, talked about uh, something called the hierarchy of uh, deservance. So we have in our imagination as policy and the imagination of, of policymakers and sometimes even in our imagination as you know advocates for refugee rights we tend to sometimes marginalize some voices and that is something we all need to work on um, so in terms of that hierarchy i think um, we come back for me we come back again to the same point that is the political framework with which within which these crises are unfolding because to be brutally honest um, the world is going to always cherry pick. That's a reality. Um, and if you don't speak English, most probably you wouldn't be sitting on a panel, unfortunately. Uh, and you wouldn't be making it through the door of a European embassy in, a, in an Arab country, most probably. You see, so uh, this is, of course, doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to be inc as inclusive as possible. But sp speaking from a pragmatic and realistic point of view, um, I think we're having higher hopes in the human race than we should. Um, and consequently, I think it's important to think that um, to think that if we don't address this in political terms, it's going to be very, very difficult to be inclusive. Um, I don't see any other, um, as a Syrian and as a previous refugee, I'm Swedish today, uh, thanks to the uh, Swedish uh, refugee system that gave me a nationality only after four years in the country. I think if we don't address politics, part of the conversation is going to be, unfortunately, meaningful. On the second question on the creation versus integration, um, I think what worries me about such a conversation is, all, again, the domination of the economic drive uh, as the only carrier of such efforts. Very important efforts. There is a discussion now in Jordan about the creation of special economic zones for Syrian <laughs> refugees. Wonderful. But those people also need justice in order to move forward. They need stability, predictability. Uh, they need a sense of community. Uh, and the, the financial dimension doesn't alone create that. So I think the, having a holistic approach vis-a-vis -vis that, uh, and talking in the very basic terms of uh, political science, what creates a community? You see, um, fin fin finance is going to be very important. But also remembering that people don't end up where they end up um, just because of financial reasons. Um, so that's it, I think. Primal. Well, I, you know, I would say, um, Sasha, we've, we've worked together, and I'm, I'm really curious about the self-reliance index um, and would love to learn more. And then, Emily, what you raised around, you know, and this is similar to what Selim was saying, if it's only looked at through the economic dimension, um, uh, we are, are missing something very important. Um, I, I, think, I think one thing that um, I reflect on around things that we are not yet doing that we could be doing is um, doing a better job of educating the public. Most of our site visitors are from the U.S. and around uh, things like the Global Compact and um, the need in an era of populism um, to, to um, think of ourselves as earthlings first and not a narrow identity. And um, and so the, it's it, this this panel um, has has got me reflecting more about kind of more creative partnerships and creative ways of using the assets we have um, towards um, you know towards something more hopeful. So Bob, any final thoughts? And then Sana will end with you with yeah. just, I mean, just a minute that, each. Clearly, New York or in America, with all the challenges, there is an opportunity more for integration or success even in opposite, to remain a voice and to be in opposition, to organize yourself as a, as a business and a consultant that, that will be a, an active political voice as possible. I worry in many other cases where we have long-term permanent caps, segmentation, and, and knowing, well, I knew the Middle East, 
I mean, the first thing, the Palestinian community have been for generations now, whether it's in Jordan or Lebanon or it was probably in Syria. I mean, there are encampments that still don't have rights and have been, in many ways, created communities in, in exile, in, in perpetuity, an exile of an unlikely return to. And for many, now, it, this is not even their past experience. So the reality may be there is not enough opportunity to return to, let alone the political reality and sensibility to be able to go back. So I think we have to have multiple you know, efforts here to address the needs of some very vulnerable communities that are still in very rough neighborhoods, and they have been for decades. And that, that's going to be a different strategy than, and their voices will be much harder to hear or, or to reach anyone at an embassy or in New York or the press or in Oxford. You may be proxies for some of that, but, but it'll be another one that they may not even be able to return with the change of regime. So I think we have to have multiple approaches. And I worry about the long term yeah. displaced. And with you. Yes, um, I just want to say something about climate change because just for my consciousness, um, it's literally, unfortunately, at the UN especially, it's lab labels what matters and what category you fall under. And fortunately, climate change refugees are still not re recognized as refugees. So now the GCR and GCM, you know, have been praising them, talking about these two you know, conventions, it's great work. However, they fail to, uh, to uh, recognize ITPs, internally displaced persons, and climate change refugees. So it's really unfortunate. And just the last point about the narrative, um, it's my frustration, this idealization of refugee population. You know, you either have refugees as terrorists or refugees as successful people. I, my message is always like, let's humanize, not idealize, because at the end of the day, refugees, it's just another population that have you know all different kind of people. So just l let's work on the human narrative, not the idealized. Thank you. <laughs> we came full circle. Um, I think that this discussion was not only extremely helpful for me in thinking about the work I do at the UN Foundation, but I think um, illuminated a number of networks, tools, resources that we can all be using um, in this important year um, as these two compacts proceed and a number of other events continue to unfold around the world where we need better partnership and collaboration. One of the tools we need is for all of you to fill out the surveys that are sitting in front of you. Um, this is something that's really helpful not only for um, our great friends at the Skoll Foundation, but for all of us in getting feedback on how this panel played out. Um, but please um, join with us, um, use these tools and platforms, certainly use the Network for Refugee Voices, and thank you for the incredible work you're doing there. But thank you to the panel, thanks to the audience, and um, I'll see you over the next few days, I hope. Bye. Thank you.